Honesty, passion, experience. It's Timberwolves Explosion, hosted on the sportstuff.com. And now, your host, Paladino Joey. Hello again, Timberwolves fans. Are you ready for the explosion of Timberwolves basketball? I am your host, Paladino Joey, or Joey Awaj, and Timberwolves Explosion is available on thesportstuff.com, iTunes, Stitcher, and Double Twist. Good to be back on board once again today, but as expected, the Timberwolves season has ended in five games. Five games against the Houston Rockets, that is, in the first round of the playoffs, to be a little more descriptive, but I think most of you have an idea of what I meant. Yeah, uh, it, well, I've got a lot to talk about, obviously. Lots of things to talk about. A team divided. That's the name of this episode for probably obvious reasons. Those of you that have been paying attention the past few days here, Jimmy Butler, Tom Thibodeau, and the rest of the club, the owner, all that. Uh, very interesting conversations going on around the team and such. We're going to brush the three, last three games with a broad stroke. And of course, this will be the last show for a while, for a little while, not that long, maybe for about a week or, well, obviously a week, but maybe I will jump on in a week right away if there's news, just like when the wild season ended, a week later they fire uh, general manager Chuck Fletcher, so I got right behind the mic again. And of course, then again, it all will have to depend on scheduling as well, as lawn cleanups are finally going to get started this weekend, I think, unless the ground's still too wet. But yeah, that's one of the reasons I'm able to jump right on right now rather than actually working outside. So not quite dry enough out there yet (laughs) because of the very late uh, snowfall. Um, But yes, uh, I'm glad I'm able to at least wrap up the regular season and the postseason, the uh, Timberwolves season in general, before stepping away for a couple weeks or so. Who knows, maybe it'll be a week and a half, two weeks until the next show. Uh, State of the Timberwolves is either the next show, that's not until June, I don't think it'll be that long though, there'll probably be at least one playoff catch-up show in there, and maybe some news will break, maybe the Timberwolves decide Tom Thibodeau is no longer the president of basketball operations, but uh, that somebody else will be brought in to do that job, and Tom Thibodeau will only be the coach and have the... uh, You have the two or three years remaining on his contract. So at the end of the day, um, that's kind of where things stand. It'd be three years remaining, pardon me. Uh, obviously, that's what's holding the Timberwolves back from making a major move at this point from possibly terminating Tom Thibodeau. But, uh, boy, um, <laughs> understandable because it would be a $30 million check when you t- tie in Tom Thibodeau and the general manager, of course, Scott Layden. That's $30 million you'd be giving up if you were to fire the two of them. <clears throat> Possibly you might get a resignation, though, if the Timberwolves decide, hey, you're no longer the president of basketball. We're bringing in somebody else like Jeff Van Gundy, for example. That's just an example. That's what I would have done years ago to be the president of basketball operations, and then he would hire a coach, and hopefully not himself, even though I think he's a more than capable coach. It's just you'd rather bring in new blood to be the head coach, and he could be the president of basketball, which is what we were hoping with Flip Saunders at the time, too. Uh, Flip ended up taking over as coach, and then, of course, he got uh, got sick, and that was a huge, unbelievable, unseen thing. But, of course, that's one of the reasons we are where we are today. Otherwise, Flip Saunders would still be in charge, and of a franchise that has been dysfunctional pretty much since its beginning. And there was those couple years with Flip Saunders as president of basketball operations that you just thought, hey, it's not dysfunctional. And there's actually a little bit of harmony going on. And things look so positive. And you got three young potential stars. But of course, by the time Carl was drafted, that's when uh, things started to go downward for Flip Saunders. So of course, he wasn't that bad at the time. There was just, uh, you know, he was going through treatment But then the uh, reaction to the treatment is what took over uh, from in in the in the month of September. Unfortunately, a few months after that, uh, after he was first diagnosed in June with it, and or at least he announced it. Maybe he was diagnosed in May, but he didn't announce it until June. Uh, Him being Flip Saunders, of course, with the uh, lymphoma. Lord, and here we are. All these here we are. These these few years later, and struggling, frustrated. Um, There was a plan in place. A long-term plan, a trust-the-process type of plan from Flip Saunders. And it would look very positive. It would take a little time for the guys to develop, but they would develop together. And things would build into a potential championship-caliber team for a long period of time. And then things happened the way they happened. And then you bring in Tom Thibodeau, who I had concerns with coming in. I had reservations of bringing in Tom Thibodeau two years ago. Check it out, April 2000. 
16, April 2016, the thoughts of bringing in Tom Thibodeau. Obviously a capable coach defensively, this and that. But then president of basketball and head coach, hmm. And his history in Chicago, questionable, playing certain guys too much, this and that. And the obsession with win now and with bringing in guys that you know and and trust and all that. I understand that. That goes in everyday life, that people want to work with people they know and they trust. But sometimes, you know... (laughs) What was wrong with the current team that was here that you had to completely tear it apart the way you did? Uh, Not that he completely tore it apart, but you tore down some walls just so we can win now, this and that. Um, And then you have so many draft picks that we miss out on. I mean, it breaks your heart when you think of uh, that whole Jimmy Butler trade. What if that pick ended up being Donovan Mitchell instead? You know what I'm saying? And I mean, not ever trading for Jimmy Butler or maybe a trade a uh, Wiggins instead. Something like that. Or you don't trade Levine. I, I, I don't know. You trade Wiggins instead of Levine, this and that. How different would history be? Or again, you just don't trade for Jimmy Butler and you figure things out with a possible Donovan Mitchell, Zach Levine, and Andrew Wiggins. Somebody probably would get traded for something here and there. But imagine Donovan Mitchell on this roster. It just drives you crazy thinking about it. Um, and I will mention Game 3 was awesome, the way the Wolves really thoroughly pounded the Houston Rockets. That was fun and encouraging, and it's like, wow, that's a pretty damn good basketball game. And Carl Anthony Towns did step up after a couple of icky games. But again, you sit here as I continue to twist things all over the place, as I apologize for that, changing the subject as I roll here. Um <clears throat> I mean, you know, the frustration of Carl Anthony Towns when he faces good teams and good players, he gets pushed around a little bit and he tends to pout and he kind of wilts and he struggles and he just isn't the same guy. And that's what's hurt Carl Anthony Towns' career so far. But kind of back to where I was with, uh, and again, Carl had a solid game against Houston. It wasn't that great, 5 of 13, but, you know, at least he got to double digits, 18 points. It was a fun overall game. Butler had his best game of the playoffs. Teague was phenomenal. Uh, Wiggins was solid until the latter stages of the series. The first three games, Andrew Wiggins played very well. Uh, not spectacular, but very well. Uh, he shot the ball well. He was taking smarter shots. He was he was driving to the basket. And then game four happened. And boy, there's whoa, boy, there's a lot to say there. Um, I'll get back to Tom Thibodeau in a second, where's where I'm heading. Um, but again, that fourth game, I mean, you had the 50-point third quarter that leaves you stunned beyond belief. The Wolves are actually down by only a point at halftime. Then they're trailing by 30 at the end of the third quarter. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. The closest thing I can remember was the Golden Horrors. And there's so many tentacles to why I hate the Golden State Warriors. And it has to do with one of the one of the starting reasons was back in the day, way back. I don't know if it was 01, maybe? No. Yeah, 2000, 2001. A mediocre at best Golden State Warriors team. Um, that had Larry Hughes at the time. God bless Larry Hughes, by the way. But uh, the Timberwolves were leading by 20 in that game, and they lost by 30. So, I mean, again, there's your 50, there, there's a 50-point turnaround in that game. Unbelievable. It was during the course of the game. The Wolves were blowing out the, the uh, Warriors, and they lost by 30. Uh, I've just, again, this is the closest thing I've seen to it. A uh, 50-point third quarter just leaves you stunned beyond belief, and the game was over. I mean, it's over. You're down by 30. And then you have fans calling into fan line and all that saying oh you know the fans need to get behind this team blah 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 what do the fan how how are the fans getting frustrated and and or uh, lethargic in that third quarter have to do with the wolves losing by 30 points in that quarter literally giving up 30 points giving up 50 total in that quarter Uh, i mean i don't know i don't think you can say that the fans need to get more into it and be more supportive of this team that is uh Pretty lame. Um, To not expect a little bit of apathy during things happening the way they did in that third quarter, I think you're delusional. Um, Go ahead and paint your face and bring in the pom-poms all you want. I know there's about a quadrillion of you out there that are like that, but um, sometimes you cannot get mad at a fan base for kind of getting to a point where the apathy sets in a little bit. A game like that, I mean, what can you do? You're in stunned silence because you can't believe what you're watching. Um... And yes, it was like every call went the Rockets' way. Every time somebody moves a step and they fall on the floor, up, charging call. But if the Wolves take a charge, uh, it's a blocking call. And then up, he touched the ball. Oh, that's a foul. He he, he hacked uh, Chris Paul's wrist. You know, there is all that frustration, and it's sickening and disgusting. But still, when absolutely nothing is going your way, and then you have Andrew Wiggins 
trotting up the court and just nonchalantly hoisting up little mid-range shots and then da 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 after he misses it, he just kind of turns around and da 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 back the other way on kind of defense, you could call it. It's just kind of going through the motions. Oh, here we go. I'm going to shoot it and blah, 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 blah. I'm going to turn around and go back the other way because obviously I missed again. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just this. It is what it is. <sighs> yeah, it is what it is. All right. It, play, you know, games like that one make me clamor for trading Andrew Wiggins this summer. I am clamoring for it when I see stuff like that. But his performance in the first three games were extremely encouraging. But the last two, horse shit. Pardon my French. Horse shit. Absolute utter crap. And you know what? God bless Andrew Wiggins. I want him to succeed so bad, but if he's going to play like that, I can't take it. You know, and it's just, and it's not just his fault. Obviously, the coaching schemes and, you know, the coach can have something to do with something offensively, something, the shot selection. When players continue to do the same thing over and over again and nothing's changing in it, obviously that can fall on the coach. Can't it, can it not fall on the leadership? And obviously a team divided, which is what we're seeing. Now, Derrick Rose had a nice game, 17 points, nice first half at the very least. I like Derrick Rose's addition. He even hit a couple threes in the game, which I deeply appreciate. I would like to see Derrick Rose stay on this team, but he's not one of those guys you absolutely, positively have to keep because you need some catch-and-shoot three-point players in this club. There needs to be some more catch-and-shoot on this team. I think Belitza can continue to bring that from a stretch floor. Unfortunately, he's in a contract year, so hopefully the Wolves can bring him back at a fairly reasonable contract. We'll talk about that and State of the Wolves and all that because that'll be a huge topic. Jamal Crawford, you know what? It's been good. I'm sorry, no offense. I'm ready for Jamal to go. He's not a catch-and-shoot player. He's just a ball hog. He is a pounder. He pounds the ball and forces up shots. I don't want Jamal Crawford on this team next year. God bless you, Jamal. You're a great... He's really a good interview. Phenomenal interview. Not that I would know about that. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, by hearing him, yes. Not by doing it myself. A phenomenal interview. He's a specimen. Somebody that's, what, eight months younger than me and moving around the way he does. God bless him. I love what he's able to do. I don't want him on this team next year because I don't think he brings what this team needs. You need some catch-and-shoot spark plug shooters off the bench. You need that, especially in this modern NBA, because everybody's going to flop and take charges, so the response to flopping and charging is what? Catch-and-shoot threes, right? That's why the Warriors are successful. It's the way the NBA has turned because of the zone defense. Everyone's standing in the lane, or at least close to it, not in the lane, but around it. They're they're literally zoning that lane a bit. If anybody dares to drive to the basket and, oh, another charge. Oh, that's just great basketball. we got to call charges on every bleep and play because that's all people want to do is take charges because they're the toughest guy in the history of the world and woohoo for them. Um, so then you respond to that with, okay, if you're going to play like that, then okay. <laughs> we'll get guys to rotate around quick enough for that half second or full second, whatever, to catch and shoot the ball and when we get good enough at it, we're going to start winning rings, you know, and that's what the Warriors did, and that's what the Rockets might do this year, because they look damn good. Um, after getting their asses handed to them in game number three, the Rockets came back and handed the Wolves' asses back to them, unfortunately, in the next two games. Um, in both cases, the Wolves played extremely well in the first half, and in the second half, it went downhill quickly. Um, so now back to Tom Thibodeau and the situation. Obviously, the Wolves lose 119-100 to on the 23rd of... Monday the 23rd of April, a day that will mark infamy there, that will be <laughs> that will remain in infamy as the uh, most points given up in a quarter since 1961 in the playoffs. 1961. <laughs> it's not that long ago. You know, that record hasn't stood until... That, that record hasn't stood for 56 years or anything. Or was it 57? Yeah, it hasn't stood for 57 years. That's... You know, in the NBA, that's like, that's eras. That's not, you know, we're talking like prehistoric eras here. You know what I mean? In NBA circles, the 60s, the early 60s, <laughs> that's a long time ago, man. In baseball, you had your Sandy Kovacs, you had your Jim Cotts, you had players like that. So baseball in the 60s is a long time ago too, but not quite the same as basketball where, yeah, a little while ago, just a little while ago, you know, just take a look and watch a game from 1961 and uh, get back to me on that one, how long ago that is. Hard to believe, but uh, yeah, that's that long ago, and yeah, that's how bad of a quarter that was for the Wolves defensively. What's Tom Thibodeau known for? Raise your hand. You in the back? What? Is... Defense. No, can you speak up a little bit? I can't hear you. Defense. 
Yes. Did you say def- yes, defense? Correct. There you go. Tom Thibodeau is known for defense. So when you when these type of things are happening, I, I don't care if the Rockets are the best team in NBA history. 1961. Okay. Magic's Lakers didn't do it. Larry Bird's Celtics didn't do it. The Golden State Warriors the last couple of years didn't do it. Yeah, the greatest offense in NBA history, or so some people believe. And yeah, you know, it's up there. If, if it isn't, it's up there. Last year's Warriors with Kevin Durant, the team that can't be beaten because there's too many weapons. They couldn't be beaten last year. Damn it. You know, there's nothing you can do. You know, it's like, yeah, whatever. It's like a kindergarten fighting Hulk Hogan in his prime. Shout out to Vince Gervato there, brother, right? <laughs> hey, brother! <laughs> yeah, but, okay. Um, again, defense. Does that statistic not tell you something's wrong here? And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. Obviously, the personnel has something to do with it, but you brought in better defensive players and it didn't get better. You brought in defensive players that understand Tom Thibodeau. They understand Tom Thibodeau's ancient language, right? Because he's the sage. He's the sage in Secret of Mana who speaks from the old tongue. He speaks from the old tongue, so only these special people can understand Tom Thibodeau's language. Well, if nobody can understand Tom Thibodeau, other than a couple guys, what the hell is he doing here? Huh? Huh? Is that okay to raise that question? Is that okay? Is that okay to raise it? And then you have this divisiveness going on all over the place. Well, they're not listening. I have the right scheme, but they're not listening. That's basically Tom Thibodeau's uh, language to the fan base and all that. And the fan base, the media, the media is obviously the connection to the fan base, though we may not agree that the media is the best thing in the history of the world, but it can be once in a while, uh, at least certain aspects of it. Um, but that's the trans translation we're getting is that, hey, I have the right scheme, and these guys aren't listening. Okay, well, <laughs> something's not working here because it keeps happening, and it's not changing. And if Tom Thibodeau's, if, if, if nothing's changed next year, because he will be the coach next year, barring an extreme, uh, barring Glenn Taylor losing his mind in extreme frustration and saying, fine, here's 30 bleeping million dollars, get the bleep out of my, my, my organization, which I don't think will happen. I think it will happen next year, though. If this, if this isn't dramatically changed, Tom Thibodeau will not, absolutely, positively will not reach the end of his contract and will not get renewed at any point. There will be no extension or any kind. Uh, Tom Thibodeau will be with the Timberwolves for three years, and it will be three years that we will feel were thrown in the garbage. That's right, because that's three years literally thrown away. That's what's got me a bit sad, a bit depressed. You're going to hear from Marcus the Forecaster, some extensive conversation. You will also hear from Vinrock Vince Germano in the fan interaction segment today. And if I forget to put it on, kill me, right? No, it, it came and I will not forget. <laughs> Vinrock Vince Germano with the audio submission. And yeah, a little over three minutes. And you know what? That's, uh, that's one of those things that you guys are all, the, the door is open. The door is wide open. Hop on board and do it. It's so easy to do. It took Vince about three minutes to do it. Think about it. You got a little couple of things to say. It, you know, it, anybody can, can, can get a little three-minute window in their life and throw that in. Maybe five minutes to save it and email it over or, you know, copy, paste, whatever. So easy stuff, and I'll convert it and put it in the fan interaction segment. Now, um, this was dragging, wow, longer than I thought, but a lot to say here. I haven't even gotten to the root of all this, but um, <laughs> and we'll continue it with uh, Finrock, Vince Germano. But... Uh, I feel, I feel that this win-now mode, that's done nothing. It, sure, okay, maybe we would have gotten to the second round if we were the number three seed, if Butler didn't get hurt. But you're still not going to beat the Rockets or the Warriors. It still would have been a five-game series. Breaking news, it would have been a five-game series against Houston if this was the second round. And it's the same thing, you know. Okay, we would have beaten... We would have, I mean, I don't know if we would have maybe beaten the Pelicans, but look how good they did. And the Blazers, we don't play well against them very often, but maybe if we had home court advantage, maybe. Thunder, it would have been entertaining. I think we might have outlasted them. But again, Warriors or the Rockets, your goal is to beat the Warriors or the Rockets. And unfortunately, if you're going to get to the NBA Finals, which doesn't guarantee a championship, but there's a pretty good chance you'll make it if you survive these two teams. But you've got to beat both of them to even get there, Warriors and the Rockets. So, this win-now mode thing is not working, and it's not a good idea, and I feel it has set this team back for five freaking years. I feel that. You can disagree with me, and that's okay, but I feel this has set the team back five years by doing this, and 
I don't know. And that's it could be like five years literally down the drain because what do you do now? Uh, are you able to sign Jimmy Butler? Is he going to want to come back? Uh, Glenn Taylor's comments about Jimmy Butler, uh, we, we, we really need Jimmy Butler to uh, encourage other players to take less money to come here and to hopefully win a championship. We need Jimmy Butler to recruit players in the offseason, and apparently him and his agent didn't like that. Okay, so that's nice. Uh, Jimmy Butler is basically nonstop saying that these, play, these, these young guys don't get it. Tom Thibodeau knows what he's doing, and if they can't listen, well, I'm one of the only guys that listens and gets it, this and that. It's basically that type of conversation, and then Tom Thibodeau is basically saying the same thing. And then the young guys, you're not getting much of a response from them, but I don't think it's going over well. It's a team divided. And to me, again, Tom Thibodeau, it's not working. To me, that's not working when you're seeing this much divisiveness. Um, A 57-win team that was entertaining, but then you sit down and look, and you don't see happiness among the players. You don't see happiness among the coach. You don't see happiness among a lot of the fan base. Okay, fans are enjoying... The 47 wins versus the 47 losses, right? That's better. It's a nice improvement. I'm very happy we won 47 games. Maybe we could have gotten 50 wins if Butler didn't get hurt. But it's like the most miserable winning team I've ever seen. Like, why are we so miserable? Why is the team so divided? Because it's just, it's a complete clash of reality here <clears throat> between the coach and the and the veteran players and the younger players. And they're starting to remind me of Mike Yo and the Minnesota Wild. Um, it seemed like so, like Mike Yo was harder on the young guys and the veterans could do whatever they want, basically, and say whatever they want. And that's what happened with Mike Yo with the Minnesota Wild. And that team, things got very, very dif- dysfunctional. Eventually, Mike Yo got fired. Um, Mike Yo wasn't owed $30 million when he got fired. That's the one other side of it <laughs> where Tom Thibodeau and Scott Layden, it's a package deal. So what do you do there? Hard to say, unless you do keep uh, Scott Layden and let Thibodeau go, but still, I mean, that would save some money, but would that work, or would you want to keep Scott Layton at, at, after that, and would he want to stay, or would it be a big mess, would it be a huge clash of things, I have no idea, um, the Butler edition was fascinating, it put us in more of a win-now position, and put us in the playoffs and everything, and he's a fascinating player, but he's, as you'll hear from Vince Germano, yeah, I, I agree with, let's just say I agree with Vince Germano, I'll save it, um, I'll save it for the second, for the, uh, fan interaction segment, but, um, in the playoffs, Jimmy Butler did not play that well. Um, was he still hurt? Is that part of it? Maybe, but I don't know. He had one good game out of five. One good game out of five. He was awful yesterday. Wiggins, he had three points in the third quarter. I mean, he, he, he had only scored three points by the time the third quarter had rolled around. That's not going to get it done. I mean, not, in, not on any day. Not on any day. Not against the Rockets. Not against the Milwaukee Bucks. Not against the Memphis Grizzlies. Three points is not going to get it done. I, I don't care. That's crap. Crap. Um, he had 14 points because of garbage time where the Wolves scored 30 points in the fourth quarter. 15 in the third. Obviously, the third quarter is back to haunting the Wolves again. <sighs> yeah, I mean, the fourth game, you could just feel things, uh, fifth game, pardon me, feel things uh, snowball the way they did. But um, to me, this is a team divided uh, at the end of the day. Um, and the whole thoughts of how Jimmy Butler, is he a guy that should lead this franchise? Is Andrew Wiggins a guy that should lead the franchise? Obviously, uh, Teague, Rose, no, they're, they're, they're pieces. Obviously, if Rose stays, which I think the possibility is there as long as Thibodeau's here, I guess, for one more year. We'll see where it goes, see where it goes after that. Teague, obviously, he's not a franchise player. He's a piece. He's, he's, he's helpful. He's part of the core, but he's not the core. Um, despite my frustrations, you know, see, there's Carl Anthony Towns with the frustration. He keeps wilting against tougher, tougher guys. He gets pushed around a little bit, solid defense, and then he just parks himself on the three-point line or pouts, this and that. He, he's he been better the last couple of games, which is great, the last few games here. But um, a, a nice game statistically yesterday, but obviously the team in general did not play well. Towns had a great game, actually. He outplayed everybody on the Wolves' side. Crawford had 20 points. He shot extremely well off the bench, so good for him. 8 of 10 and all that, but uh, Carl, Butler, and Wiggins, all that. There is only one player out of these three guys that, that can be given the legendary sword Excalibur, so to speak. There's only one guy, the, the only hope for this franchise, long term. It's Carl Anthony Towns, and, and that, there's no doubt about it. I mean, he's the only guy that can carry that legendary sword Excalibur, so to speak, to save this team. He's the only one. It can't be Wiggins. It can't be Butler. Um, it can't. It's only Carl. There's no way. And he has got to overcome the, the, 
the pouting, whatever it is, the inability to fight through tough opponents on occasion. Where like again, Paul Gasol, he'll have like awful games. Paul Gasol will manhandle him. It needs to change. He has to get stronger. Obviously, the weight room, all that. And there's no doubt he's hit the weights hardcore throughout his career. He's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, but he needs to keep doing it until he's so big that nobody's going to mess with him anymore. Or at least when they do, they'll be punished severely. And that's what needs to continue to happen from Carl Anthony Towns. Uh, He's the only player on this team that truly can take that mantle, and he has to do it. It's the only hope for this team is that Carl does that. You're not going to get another player with the 20th pick of the draft that ends up being the franchise player for this club. <laughs> Unless it's like the, like literally like a like, like a miracle, like winning the Powerball, that type of thing, which doesn't happen ever. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, it, it's, it has to be Carl Anthony Towns. It's not going to be Wiggins. Um, he might get traded in the offseason, regardless if Thibodeau's the president of basketball or not. He's going to, I think the chances of Wiggins getting traded are fairly high. Um, would the would, I mean, there's other teams out there that probably could believe that they could change things and Wiggins could still be that franchise player and watch him go somewhere else and be that guy. But I don't know. But you'll hear from uh, Van Rock, Vince Germano, extremely cool thoughts. I had a feeling that was coming from, and I, I, I agree, I support what uh, Vince says in the second, uh, or excuse me, in the fan interaction segment. I guess it'll be a third because I'm going to very briefly go over the playoff bracket. But uh, those are my thoughts. There's only one guy on this team that can carry that mantle. It's Carl, and it has to happen. Um, but it's not for me. It's not Butler. No, if you end up resigning him, not or not, whatever it is, it's not Butler. It has to be Towns. Even though Butler's been the best player during the course of the season, it's Towns, and all, all of us know it. Um, right now, I don't really have a favorite player on this team. I, I thought it was Butler. It's not. It's not Butler. Carl's um, inability to fight through things at times has uh, been a turnoff, and hopefully that can uh, change. He's the only one that can that, that can save this team from where they are right now as a player. As a coach, well, I don't know. I don't know. Obviously, uh, it's a very tough situation with the head coach. Tom Thibodeau should never have been the president of basketball operations. Never. That, that, you just don't do it. It, it doesn't work. Uh, Flip was a, a rare exception. Rare. And, well... You know, he was only a coach for a year at the time. Who who knows how things would have gone. I, I think it would have been okay, but Flip should have hired a coach, I think. I, I wish he did. Uh, he was going to bring in, uh, I forget the guy's name now, uh, Jaeger. Yeah, he was going to bring in Jaeger. Um, but unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, uh, he ended up staying with Memphis. Then they fired him and he went to Sacramento. So um, that would be nice if we would have had Jaeger. That would have been good, but... Well, obviously things are completely different from what they would have been. So that's kind of all she wrote there. <sighs> mm, I'm not going to pass out any Alpha Wolf. I'm not going to pass out any Flynn Memorial. I'm not. Um, Wiggins had some good games, and he looked like crap in the last two. Yeah, you get the idea. Let's uh, take a quick break, very briefly go over the bracket, and then come back for some fan interaction with some interesting thoughts from multiple people. <laughs> Fire Tom Thibodeau? Oh, say it ain't so, Joe. There you go again. And we are back for a very brief uh, look at the bracket and all that throughout the NBA playoffs. Yeah, you know, it's just, it is what it is. Eastern, Leastern, whatever you want to call it. Toronto and Washington, that's three games to two. That series is closer than it should be. Um, Toronto's messing around a little bit, losing a couple games in Washington. Will the Washington Capitals, no, the Washington Wizards, who might as well be the Capitals, I guess, uh, will they force a game seven? It's all been about home court advantage so far. Basketball is a little different than hockey, where home ice advantage doesn't always mean everything, but, well, I guess it did for the Boston Bruins, the Boston Bruins yesterday, defeating Toronto in the seventh game. That's a series that got extended. Poor Toronto. Oh, they're so good, yet they can't get out of the first round because they keep running into tougher teams in the first round. But, uh, well, that's kind of like the Wilds history every bleeping year. But, yeah, well, of course, last season, when it was St. Louis, the Wild had home ice advantage, and, yeah, that worked out not in five games, not Five games. Five. Five games. <laughs> yeah, that sucked. Just a little bit. We lost uh, all three home games, if I remember correctly. It's good stuff. Good stuff. 
Um, what am I talking about again? What am I talking about again? Uh, Cleveland and Indiana. That's been a good series. Obviously, Cleveland's number four. Indiana's number five. Great series other than game number one. That was crap. That was boring and all that. But great series, actually. Nice battle. I'm, I was kind of excited about this series from the get-go. And then LeBron hit the buzzer beater. 95 and 95. LeBron puts up a three-point shot and nails it. LeBron's hit a couple of game winners, and he got another one there, so good for him. Hit a few game winners in his career, certainly not on the level of certain players like Michael, Larry, and Magic, but yeah, he's he's up there. Obviously, he's played in more playoff games than anybody ever, pretty much. I gotta think it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and of course, series are much longer than they used to be and all that, so yeah, LeBron. Um, I would not be surprised one bit if this series went to Game 7. I think Indiana's gonna win the uh, sixth game, and... Well, LeBron in Game 7, he's pretty good. So I guess Cleveland's going to win the series. Pivotal Game 5, that's what got it done. Cleveland winning Game Number 4 in Indiana, actually, is what... That's what did it. Uh, Indiana was winning that game, and they let it go. So Indiana could have won this series. They could have, and they're not going to now. Um, it'll be a 7-gamer, but I think Cleveland will last the Indiana Pacers. Like, 8-point victory, something like that, in Game Number 7. Philly took care of business throughout the series with Miami, except for Game Number... Uh, Game number two, where Dwayne Wade had a wonderful uh, renaissance. Dwayne Wade in the Miami Heat, only 91 points in game number five. As that's the only time this series where anybody scored under 100, believe it or not. Dwayne Wade maybe played his last game, five, four of 15 from the floor, 31 minutes off the bench, 11 points. And that maybe is the last game for Wade's career. Otherwise, it'll be a farewell tour next year. Um, he's, he's at the end, though, and it's too bad. Uh, that's a player for many years I identified as my favorite player in the NBA. And it was for a long time, from about 95 or so until, I don't know, about 2013-ish, 12, 12, 13-ish. Wade is my favorite player in the league. I just loved him. Um, when he was in his prime, he was really something. And, and back in 96, pardon me, it's tough. Um, and it's like, you know, kind of jumping back on the Wolves and everything. You're going for this win-now approach during... Uh, when the Timberwolves aren't ready to compete, and then you're just going to run into these dynasties again. And the only years teams win a championship is, you know, teams outside of this whole dynasty league, like Warriors, Bulls, um, uh, Spurs, Lakers, all that, you know, during since since about since the Larry and Magic era. And really, well, there are a couple dynasties in the 60s. There was a dynasty in the 60s, too. Pretty safe to say, right? Only eight championships for the Celtics. They won, like, what, 11 in, like, a... Uh, 15 year span or something that's you know insane um so the nba is a dynasty league but teams like miami sneak sneak up in like the 96 uh god almighty 2006 of course they did have Shaq on the team but there is that magical year where it's just you're just the best team that year um Dallas in 2011. And, and also at the same time, see, the Spurs were not a team that won back-to-back -back championships. There's zero back-to-backs on the Spurs resume in their five titles. Um, so Miami was able to squeeze one in there, and the LA Lakers weren't good at the time, obviously because Shaq wasn't there anymore, and they were kind of rebuilding, reloading, so to speak, for their next run with Kobe and Pau Gasol in the next couple of years, which Pau had not been there yet. Um, so that was Miami's chance to sneak in there. And then, of course, Dallas, same thing. L.A. was getting old and falling apart a little bit in 2011. Um, a little bit. You know, they weren't as good. Dallas took care of business there. So that's why the Dallas Mavericks were able to squeeze one out. But see, see, the Wolves, they need that kind of a magical season. And it's going to be Carl Anthony Towns is going to have to take that, again, like I always call it, the legendary sword, so to speak. He's going to have to be that hero to lead the Timberwolves. And that's the, that's the way we're going to do it. A win-now approach isn't necessarily going to get that job done. Dallas was just the best team that year. Uh, smart free agent acquisitions, and then your star player being your star player. That's how why Dallas won the championship in 2011. Obviously, smart additions and all that. Um, Dallas isn't exactly a team that wasn't exactly a team that was uh, <laughs> penny pinching. So there is that. Obviously, Mr. Uh, Mark Cuban spent a lot of money on that team, this and that. But smart additions, this and that, not trading away major assets to change the entire landscape of your team, or at least a big portion of the landscape of your team, just so you can win now, is not a way to go. And I think Thibodeau made a big mistake. Um, I do. Um, I, I I don't know how much longer Butler's going to be in his prime, quite frankly. So there, that got me going, my thinking about D-Wayne Wade. That was a thought I wanted to squeeze into segment number one. But then again, it, this kind of show, it flows, you know. I was talking about so many other things. There just wasn't room for it at the time. Um, Boston, Milwaukee. I'm disappointed in the Bucks. 
you know, you got to take advantage of some of these games, but then again, I guess, whatever. It was in Boston. Game number five was in Boston, so I shouldn't be that disappointed. It's probably going to be Celtics in seven. It looks like another one of those home court advantage series. That's basically how it's going. Um, if the Obviously, if the Celtics win game six, the series is over. So, uh, Bucks will win game six and four is the seventh, but the Celtics, uh, seven games, they always win game seven when they're at home. So, uh, Celtics will win that. Rockets in Minnesota, we know what happened there, unfortunately. Utah and Oklahoma City, nice massive comeback by the Oklahoma City Thunder. 25-point comeback by the OKC Thunder. Very impressive. Good job by Russell Westbrook and co. It's getting a little personal between Westbrook and Rubio, and I noticed it many years ago, actually. Uh, Westbrook is basically saying, I need to shut that shit down after uh, Rubio. Pardon me, that's the second S-word I've thrown in the show, but, eh, you know, it's not the worst thing I've ever done. Um, awesome series for, uh, or awesome game for Paul George and Russell Westbrook. Holy mother of Moses. 79 points for these guys combined. 79 with two players there. Yeah, Paul George, 34 points. The future Laker, according to Vince Germano. Vinrock Vince Germano. Carmelo Anthony is just an afterthought you know, at this point. Um, maybe Paul George stays there. I don't know. But if you're struggling to even get past Utah, as good as Utah is, if you're struggling like this in the first round, I don't know if Paul George wants to stay there. I think the ch- chances of winning a championship are slim to none for the OKC Thunder. But welcome to our world, I guess. You know, It's a dynasty league, and if you're not one of them, you're going to have a hell of a time. That's why a team, like imagining a team like Utah winning a championship, it'd be like a one-year wonder thing, like the Mavericks. It would be. Um, I don't think this is the year for them, obviously. There's too much uh, too much heavy artillery waiting for them coming up. So, uh, yeah, good luck to you, unfortunately. Uh, but great series for Utah, but an awesome individual game for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Entertaining series, one of the best series of... The playoffs. I think Indiana Cleveland's pretty good. Obviously, West Co- Western Conference basketball to the uh, the modern NBA fan, we'll call them. The younger one is more attractive than Eastern Conference basketball. I like the Eastern Conference just fine. I have no problem with it. But obviously, sure, the West is fine too. And uh, this has been a hell of a series. Uh, West got 39 shots though to get those 45 points. So you got to put that into perspective. But regardless, impressive comeback in the second half by the OKC Thunder. 25 point comeback. Not bad. And Rubio did not have a good game. Only 10 points and 4 of 14 shooting. So, and he missed both of his free throws. Aw. <laughs> but he hit two threes, though. So, he's so much better. I know. And yes, he is. He is better. Donovan Mitchell, that's the real star of the Utah Jazz. It's not Rubio. It's not Gobert. Gobert. It's Donovan Mitchell. And he's the next Dominique Wilkins, man. I think so. Well, at least modern era version. Modern era version. I mean... You can't always touch those legends. I think, obviously, Wilkins is a legend. He's wonderful. Uh, Mitchell might be a modern-day version of him, though, I suppose. Obviously, a ways to go to get there, but he looks awesome, and I like him. And I wish he was on the Wolves. And he was available at 7 last year. He was available at 7, and he ended up going 13. Such is the luck of every Minnesota team. And I know, 12 other teams passed on Donovan Mitchell, so whatever, man. It's just, it's always like that. Pelicans, they pecked, they hen-pecked, they pecked out the eyes of the Portland Trailblazers, and they, uh, yeah, they ate all their fish, too, all the fish in that, that little western, uh, that little, uh, the little port there, the little bay there in Portland, um, beautiful city, and all that, but, uh, the Pelicans got the job done, four-game sweep, that is some impressive stuff, uh, a team that can really play ball, 131 points against the, the Trailblazers, they're not the Trailblazers, just, I'll just call them the right thing, Wow, they look really good, the Pelicans. And um, they're going to have a hell of a time in the next round, but who knows? Go get them. Go get them, Pelicans. Go, Pelicans. That Drew Holiday and Anthony Davis. You thought the 79 points by uh, Russell Westbrook and Paul George was impressive? Yeah, how about 88 for Holiday and Davis? 88. 88, that's right. Uh Only 16 assists for uh, Rondo in the game, too, by the way. Welcome back to the NBA, Rajon Rondo. And this Pelicans team is a threat. They're a threat. They rock. <laughs> they rock. Go Pelicans. I, I hope they win the Western Conference, but the odds of that happening, yeah, well, well, you know what? Show up and play, guys, and hope for the best. You got, it's a well-put-together team. I mean, Drew Holiday's a stud. Rajon Rondo is a, he, you know, he's a Peyton Manning out there, man. Like, kind of, not really. I'm just messing around, but he's a spectacular uh, point guard when he's on his game and when he's healthy. If he can stay healthy, whew, Anthony Davis is a, is what we'd like Carl to become. I think he can be. Very, very possible. Very possible. And then you have Miritich, catch and shoot. 
I mean, that's a well-put-together team. You have other weapons off the bench. How can you not like the New Orleans Pelicans? That's a good team, man. <laughs> that's a good team. You know, I kind of like the Blazers, too, obviously. Talk about a team that can shoot the basketball, but they're just not good enough, damn it. You know, they're like the Minnesota Wild. They're just not good enough. They make the playoffs, and they lose. That's basically what the Blazers are. They make the playoffs, and they lose. They're just not good enough. And that's all there is to say. There is a time to move on from the coach. I, they probably should. Um, I'm not a huge hater of Stotts. I know a lot of others are. I'm not a huge backer either. Um, I think they need to make a coaching change. And it's not necessarily because he's a bad coach. But but sometimes change is needed. Um, and if you could bring in a young, a, a younger... Uh, a younger voice, a younger voice, maybe more energetic, maybe just a better fit. I don't know, just different philosophy, just just a different philosophy. Maybe Portland can get over the hump. Obviously, you need to get lucky. You know, smart free agent, smart draft pick that ends up shocking the world like Donovan Mitchell. So there's always possibilities out there. Um, you know, Mitchell's not even necessarily a franchise player, but he kind of can be. He's certainly a money maker, that's for sure. If he's not your best player, he's your most ex- most expensive. He's your your most valuable player in terms of putting players uh, fans in the seats. So, yeah, well put together team though. Portland, uh, excuse me, New Orleans. Portland's entertaining, but they're not winning. And Golden State, San Antonio, we saved the best for last. Not uh, easy series for the Warriors. The Spurs won one game. The they talk about a team that needs to kind of move on from where they're at. Why is Mano Ginobili still playing? <laughs> He's older than me. Why is he still playing? Why? <laughs> Time to move on, guys. Uh, Rudy Gay, that's another whatever. Has been, never was. That's what Rudy Gay is. LaMarcus Aldrich, say what you want about how great he is. I think he's a, I, I think he's a never was. I really do. I don't like LaMarcus Aldrich. He is a never was in my eyes. Um, I don't know. Paul Gasol is, wow. He's, he's, he's still got it, but obviously he wasn't spectacular in this series. But who can be spectacular? Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili, uh, you know, they've got the rings, they've got the pedigree, they've been phenomenal in their career. Ginobili can still play, don't get me wrong. He's wonderful, but he's older than me, though. I mean, I I don't know. He should probably be on a different team or something. I don't know if he wants to keep playing. They need to move on, man. I don't know. But he probably would never want to suit up in anywhere else now. It's way too far in. Um, Spurs are a, a, a franchise that's had an unbelievable success. But unfortunately, the thing with Kawhi Leonard is odd, to say the least. I'll, uh, that's the word I could come up with, odd. It's weird. Um, I don't know what to say. Just uh, good luck to the Spurs, and uh, at least they were able to squeak out a win. An impressive win, actually, but too little too late. What was it, game number four? So too little too late, and the Warriors took care of business without uh, the greatest player ever. Okay, not really. Um a guy who gets hurt every year in the playoffs and other players go on and be the MVP of the team. So that's nothing new. <laughs> yeah, well, I made my point. You get it. You got it. And, uh, well, I don't know. I'm going to stick with the Rockets winning the championship because they go on runs. And when they go on runs, they fry you like you wouldn't. I mean, they fry you like I don't even know. They just fry you. That's what they do. I, I don't have a comparison. I don't want to come up with anything. Might say something stupid, so <laughs> no, no point. Um, the war, yeah, the Rockets will be. It's going to be an incredible series, though. Western Conference Finals. That's where the Warriors. Uh, a number of weapons might be a fact. Might be the reason again why they get past the Rockets. Obviously, the experience, the pedigree, this and that. But I think the Rockets have enough weapons also to make it uh, a very difficult series for the Warriors. And of course, home court advantage in the NBA is gold, and that's what will hopefully, for the Rockets' case, uh, sake, will uh, be enough for them to survive the Warriors. Let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll open the Fan Interaction segment with the very first audio submission from a guy who has been on this show in the past multiple times, and we've also hosted a show together, Showtime and Teebles, which will be revived from the dead one of these days. It will come back. It's just one of these days type of thing. <laughs> you know how things are with that sometimes. It's just eventually. Um, so... Yeah, we'll be back very shortly. Vince Germano will take over Fan Interaction briefly.
Paladino Joey. It's Vince from the beautiful Melbourne, Australia, and also Australia's number one basketball podcast, the Courtside Podcast. Uh, mate, I'm going to try and keep this as quick as possible regarding Jimmy Butler um, and what I call the Butler effect. Um, look, I'm not saying Jimmy Butler is not a very good basketball player. He is not a superstar. Um, since arriving in Minnesota, he has been treated like the second coming of Michael Jordan. Well, it looks that way from all the way here in Australia anyway. Um, uh, if you're going to be treated like the second coming of Michael Jordan, you'd want to play like it in the in the NBA playoffs, especially when it's the first time you've been there since in about 40 years. So uh, I, it leads me into my next point of the Butler effect and the Butler effect it's this is what is the problem with Andrew Wiggins and at times I think Carl Anthony Towns if anyone is happy with Wiggins averaging 17 points a game in his third or fourth year you've got rocks in your head Jimmy Butler in my opinion that's just my opinion from the outside looking in he has uh, stunted the development of Andrew Wiggins I don't think Andrew Wiggins enjoys playing with Jimmy Butler. I think there's a bit of resentment there. I think sometimes Butler, uh, Jimmy uh, Wiggins looks at Butler and and sort of just says, you know, I should be the man around here. But who knows? I could be wrong. It's, uh, as I said, it's just me looking in from the outside, and I I just don't think Jimmy is the type of guy to or type of player to lead a team and put a franchise on his back. Could he help a franchise guy? I mean, imagine him playing next to LeBron. Yes, he could. But to ask him to strap strap the franchise on his back and have those playoff moments where he just goes on a tear and carries a team on his back, a la Kobe, Tim Duncan, even guys like Manu who, who got it done, I just don't see that in Jimmy. Yes, he's had big games. Even in Chicago, but even in Chicago, I did not see him as that guy. Uh, when there was talk of him coming to the Lakers, yeah, I was happy because we'd win a few more games, but I was never like, wow, we could win a title with this bloke. I just don't see it. Um, I don't think it'd hurt to make the call to the Spurs and um, see what you can do to get Leonard because uh, there's a guy that could really help and and. You know, I'd love to see that happen because uh, I, as much as I'm a Laker fan, I do have a, a, a love for the, the Timberwolves because of Luke Longley. And, uh, yeah, look, that that's basically I don't want to ramble for too long, but I just, nutshell, Jimmy Butler, I don't think he's been good for the development of Andrew Wiggins and at times Carl Anthony Towns. I hope this made sense. Uh, have a great show, brother. Um, talk to you real soon. And go Wolves. What's going on here? Who are you to say Jimmy Butler isn't the best player on the team? You're not a fan. This time I'm a Laker fan too. Oh my god. Why is a Laker fan calling in a Timberwolves explosion, right? No, that's like... <laughs> that's where some of the uh, blue and green shades might come in with certain people. But no, I mean, that was uh, awesome. See, th- thank you very much, Vin Rock. Vince Germano out of Melbourne, Australia. Of course, part of the Courtside Podcast with Wayne Hunt himself and of course uh yep Wayne Hunt Vince Germano and Stu Benson awesome basketball show it is definitely the best show in Australia and about as good a basketball show as there is on the planet much less Australia um so thanks again so much for that and again it just shows how easy it is to jump on board do an audio submission I was begging to please jump on because I know you wanted to talk about Jimmy Butler the Butler effect for quite a while and that's how quick you can just jump on board and that's all you got to do to get an audio submission in. Uh, just convert it over to uh, MP3 file and all that. So, sorry, now I'm going off into somewhere else. But, uh, yes, the Butler effect, I do agree that it has stunted the growth of Andrew Wiggins. I also think it's on Andrew Wiggins a bit to overcome it. Um, it's a combination of both. Um, Andrew Wiggins, I think, needs to overcome it. Uh, somebody does need to get traded. A Kawhi Leonard trade, is a, it's fascinating to me. I've always loved the guy. He went from an Iron Man to I don't know what's going on. Um, Derek Rhodes stayed healthy quite a bit for a while, and then all of a sudden the uh, ACL happened, and then it was like injuries every couple of seconds of Derek Rose. Now you're seeing energy from him, this and that. I don't know what's going to happen. Obviously, if Thibs goes, Butler goes. If Butler goes, Thibs, you know, this and that. They're probably all going to be gone at some point in the next couple of years. 
that's where I'm afraid that this may have really, really caused permanent damage to the Timberwolves, at least for uh, the next five years or so, possibly. And that's not something Wolves fans want to hear, the overly positive ones, the negative ones. I think this set the team back. I really do. Um, I know everybody out there is just crying and weeping over uh, Ricky Rubio and Zach Levine. You know, I hear you to a point. I think Rubio kind of, you know, he got better. He got better, but how much better? Um, Obviously, with Thibodeau, it wasn't going to work. Regardless, if you love Rubio, don't love Rubio. Love Thibodeau, don't love Thibodeau. It wasn't going to work one way or another. Um, I I mean, Flip Saunders wasn't married to Ricky Rubio either. He wasn't married to him, but he probably would have kept him if he kept improving. And that was the hope. Um, Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, there's so many tentacles to this. It's caused a riff in the team. It has. Tom Thibodeau and Jimmy Butler have divided this team. They have. And that's a fact. You you could not get around it. And that's, a, again, I'm glad uh, Vince Germano was able to call in, uh, call in, do the audio submission, we'll call it, uh, from Melbourne, Australia. And, yeah, I mean, that leads into exactly my point here is that they have divided this team, without a doubt. And now where do we go from here? It's tough. You're kind of stuck. Unless Glenn Taylor wants to write a $30 million check, and I don't blame him if he doesn't. But clearly, clearly, Glenn Taylor is not happy with Tom Thibodeau right now. He's not. Um, He said he was going to wait until the end of the playoffs to say if it was a successful season or not. And the talk is that there would have been a major change of some sort if the Wolves lost to Denver. Like, he missed the playoffs entirely. There would have been a change, possibly Thibodeau losing the uh, president of basketball operations, which could cause a chain reaction in terms of uh, open Pandora's box. And Tom Thibodeau then, not so long after that, would would resign, possibly, in, in anger and frustration. Um... Tom Thibodeau should not be president of basketball operations of this team. He should not. He should not. And I hope that it does get taken away very soon. Um, the guy I have I've mentioned time and time and time and time and time and time again should be the president of basketball operations is Jeff Van Gundy. He's the closest thing to Flip Saunders in my eyes. It doesn't mean he is Flip Saunders. It certainly, it certainly doesn't. But um, I think he has the capability of leading a franchise that, in in that sense, as a president of basketball operations, not as the coach. I want him to bring in young, new blood to coach the team. This team needs a young coach. They need a young coach. You know, and it obviously you hope it's the right one. You've had Rick Adelman, who is ancient and of course stubborn and all that, and and in win now mode, desperate to win something. Tom Thibodeau, older and desperate to win now. Stubborn. Small rotations and all that. Small bench, not wanting to play the, this young guy, that young guy. I mean, David Patton didn't even see the court this year. That's bullcrap. He, he could have played a little bit. We need a younger coach. We need a different coach. And that's all there is to say. And, of course, catch and shoot three-point players. And, like, multiple. And I know it's just... Obviously, there's plenty of guys in college. That's been the focus for a lot of players in college, whether you're a center or a point guard, (laughs) to be able to shoot a catch-and-shoot shot as long as the center isn't doing it constantly. We have a center that does that already, so let's hopefully find some some, some wingmen that can do that as well. And hopefully Tyus Jones can work on that hardcore in the offseason, and he really needs to work on that uh, catch-and-shoot three. Because if he gets that going, Tyus Jones will be in the league for double-digit seasons. And it's going to be a nice, long, successful career for Tyus Jones, even if it's just off the bench. But a spark plug who can get you three or three three pointers a game or something, wouldn't that be nice? That'd be great. And I think Tyus Jones could do that. Just, you know, it can be done. Just work on that catch and shoot three. It's not the hardest thing in the world. It's not. And he's, he's a young and spry player. He can get open and catch and shoot. So it's possible. It's not like he's like plodding and slow. It's he's, he's capable of it. And obviously the smart uh, passing capabilities. Tyus Jones could have a Larry Long successful career, albeit as a backup, not a starter. But again, 25 minutes a game, that's that's enough. That's enough to be a major factor on any team. Um, so thanks again, Vin Rock, Vince Germano, for getting me going once again. And that's what it's all about. Uh, good conversation there. Kawhi Leonard, my fear with him is he's... He, does he want to go to the Lakers? Does he want to go to a different team? Who knows? Does he going to go to the Washington Wizards? I mean, who who knows? He he might go anywhere, but the odds of him staying with the Wolves are slight. But maybe he'd maybe he'd be a match made in heaven for Tom Thibodeau. I guess I don't know. But uh, you trade Wiggins in that case, you'd probably have to. Uh, obviously, uh, Wiggins and maybe more. <laughs> Vince was going as far as to say Wiggins and Butler for uh, Kawhi Leonard. Extremely risky, but yeah, you'd have to sign an extension in the deal to do it. There'd have to be a sign and trade, like extension type of deal to make that trade. And of course, money would have to match as well, because we're talking big bucks here. Um, it would I, I don't know, it'd be very hard to trade both of them, I think, because of the, the uh, both of them in one trade. So there's that too. 
Um, if it's Wiggins, you'd have to include multiple draft picks, probably. This and that. If it's Butler, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I doubt it's going to happen, but we'll see. So under the Twitter account, at Wolves Explosion, at Wolves Explosion. Looks like this show is going to be a teeny bit longer. <laughs> Lots of conversation, but it is what it is. Uh, I want to thank Vince Germano for retweeting the most recent show. Episode 230, Towns' Reality Check. This one, of course, is a team divided. Levi Brown, out of New Zealand, says, A lot of Wolves showed up today. This is Game 3. Teague, Butler, Wiggins, Rose were all great, and Towns worked hard. Gorgie had some big plays in his limited minutes, too. And I better not forget what Marcus Forecaster had to say also. I'll get back to that after in between the Twitter here. Ooh, I almost forgot about the Forecaster. I can't do that because we don't hear from him much. Um, yeah, wow, uh, here we go, okay, um, Tanae Brown was saying, yep, he loved to really like the shot selection from Andrew Wiggins, and that was good, he was very efficient in the first three games, he was decent in game number, no, he was not decent in game number five, he was terrible in games four and five, but the first three, he was good, and that was encouraging, but we'll see, Terrible. Uh, he, he reverted back to what we didn't like. Things are going to get real interesting back and forth here. Uh, Kalen Woods and Vince Gerbato. Oh, boy. Kalen, look at you, man. I love you. Love you, Kalen, but look at you. Sure, the Wolves don't miss him now after, again, uh, Mr. Yuck. Uh, Ricky Rubio had a triple-double, and then uh, Vince Gerbato says they'd never admit it. This is all on Twitter, of course. I was saying enough already, and basically and Vince told me to stop it. And he says, I know because Rubio makes it look good. Uh-huh. He said, I think just about every team has a story like that. Yep, in terms of how guys leave, they don't play well where you're at, and then they play better somewhere else. It's always like that. Um, he says, plus, in my opinion, how does Thibs not give Rubio at least one season with Wiggins, Butler, Towns, etc.? Interesting thought there. I didn't even see that tweet. I apologize, Vince. I could have kept the conversation going, but maybe it was late at night. I don't remember. Obviously, the uh, time zone's slightly different between uh, Australia and Minnesota. Just a little bit, but... <laughs> I should have gotten back. Uh, I feel bad. But um, Vince continues, but at least it's getting on air here. He says, but the thing is, Rubio has never, and he was kind of going back and forth with uh, Kalen Woods, too. The thing is, Rubio has never stopped working on his game from what I saw. So, again, I don't understand how Thibs didn't give him a reason uh, season with this group. I do like Teague a lot, by the way. I just guess. I do like Teague a lot, by the way. I guess I just think Rubio would have helped with the Jimmy Butler effect. Interesting. Yeah, he might have. He might have. Uh, uh, it's it's all tough to say. I, it's just it's too bad because obviously him and Thibodeau weren't on the same page. But you know what? Who is on the same page with Thibodeau? Jimmy Butler. Maybe Taj Gibson. E- even Gibson was frustrated with the minutes. Teague isn't on. Uh, Teague. I don't know whose page he's on, but Teague's on Teague's page. That's who Teague's page is. That's who Teague's. <laughs> Teague is on Teague's page. I think he's an interesting guy. Uh, Jeff Teague. He's he's an interesting guy, but when he does play well, I really like Jeff Teague. He's got the he's got the skill, and I do believe that J- Jeff Teague cares. Yes, uh, anybody that says Jeff Teague doesn't care, I don't agree with that. Um, some games he might kind of go into pout mode, but then again, who doesn't these days? Um, who seriously? Who doesn't? Um, like LeBron James wasn't pouting in some of those later stage games in the NBA Finals the last couple of years. Yes, he was in, in in the ones they were losing anyway. Um, Kalen Woods says, yeah. May have been stagnant with Rubio, but you seriously upgraded your offensive firepower in Butler and Wiggins, and Cat got another year older, or even half a season, to see how he'd have panned out. Would have been good. In my opinion, Rubio is better fit than Teague. So this is kind of a conversation back and forth between Vin Rock, Vince Germano, and Kalen Woods there, which is totally fine. Uh, Levi Brown says, yeah, but I was basically saying I'll let this sink in. The target center only, you know, we only trailed by one point and we gave up 50, blah, blah, blah. And I posted that on the uh, Facebook page too. Uh, Levi Brown responds to that. Says, I saw the first half, which was a fun one. Had to miss the third quarter and I returned. We're suddenly down 30. Yep. Safe to say I didn't bother switching back on, switching it back on. Uh, well, the last game and a half were at least fun, I guess. And yeah. Basically, because game game number five was crap too, unfortunately. Ah, uh, here we go. This is what's really interesting. You're gonna hear a very familiar name here retweeting Vinrock's post to me, Vince Germano's post to myself. With Shane Heal, Shane Heal got more of a run with you, blokes. You would have loved him. And guess who retweeted it? Shane Heal. That's right. It is the real Shane Heal because Vinrock did use Shane Heal's Twitter account when he said, "Wish I, I wish that Shane Heal would have uh, gotten more run with you, blokes. With you, blokes." Shane Heal retweeted 
That that is cool. Uh, I'm guessing Vince knows already. That's cool. <laughs> Isn't that great? Uh, Vince uh, tweeted this about six hours ago at this point, and Shane Heal had retweeted it. Of course, again, the time zone's quite different, so that's why. Um, must be the. It must have been like a really late night time already there, and early morning here in that case. Uh, Levi Brown says basically my feelings on the season. It was a success compared to years past, but it was a lot, lot less satisfying than I thought it would be, and that is absolutely a fact. Uh, Drew Mahawald uh, re- tweeted out, overall 2017-18 was a successful season for the Timberwolves, 47 wins and a playoff victory over one seed despite missing Butler for 20-some games is a large step forward from last year. Yep, it's a large step forward, but it's the most miserable team, <laughs> as in unhappy. I don't mean miserable like I hate the team. and No, the most unhappy group of players and coach I've seen ever, basically. Well, maybe not ever, but see, like if Cleveland had 47 wins, which is basically about what they were too, there's a little craziness and unhappiness, but they were a championship contender. We were a team that hadn't been in the playoffs for forever. So again, there, for us to be as unhappy as we were, it's frustrating. And you could definitely argue that that Adelman club was a fairly unhappy team as well years ago with the Love and Rubio and all that. It seemed like every year somebody got hurt or multiple players got hurt. And then this team, things didn't happen. Things just did not work out and it was freaking bullcrap. But uh, well, welcome to reality, I guess. If you're not like the Lakers or whoever, it's like, you know, you're just dying for a championship, not your 16th or 17th, like the Celtics, the Lakers, the Spurs getting their sixth championship would be their next. The Warriors have three, right? Yeah, they have. They run two recently, and they won one way uh, back in the 70s. So, yeah, well, mm, let's keep going. Uh, Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Timber Wolves Explosion. Facebook.com forward slash Timber Wolves Explosion. And I was saying the same thing. Let this sink in. In target center, the Timberwolves only trailed by one point at halftime. In the third quarter, they gave up 50 points and scored 20. That's a differential of 30 in one bleeping quarter. That's all she wrote. Nothing more to see here. And Levi Brown had an angry uh, reaction. He's like, you know, <laughs> and Mr. Motto had the sad reaction. Ali Sidikai locally here says, awful, awful quarter that was. Nicholas Simon out of Australia says, just pathetic. God, I really hate thibs. He clearly is not motivating Cat or Wiggins to do the right things. He's a defensive specialist, with air quotes. Coach, uh, he's a defensive specialist, which which was quoted. Uh, coach, whose team sucks on D. He goes against the wisdom of every single person in the basketball world by running his starters into the ground and endangering his players. He just sucks. Yep, I was saying he'll be back next year only because of his contract, and of course, if this happens next season, he's gone. Yep. After next season, I do believe Tom Thibodeau will be toast. I think he's finished after next season. I wrote that Tom Thibodeau will not last to the end of his contract. Way too much animosity is already forming on all levels, and nobody responded, and it only reached like a small margin of people. I don't know what it is. Uh, Everybody ran away or what? Kind of frustrating. So that ends the face of crazy. Let's get to the forecaster now, because I have it right in front of me. I was basically saying what another disaster your thoughts would be helpful for the show. And luckily, myself and the forecaster are back in contact again. Sometimes he just disappears for a while. Uh, he recently had his second child, so good for him with his wife there. So congratulations to Marcus the forecaster bringing in another boy. So two boys there. Mr. Forecaster. Noah looks a lot like Ender Wiggins, by the way. That's the older son. So we'll continue. Uh, Mr. Forecaster says, I'll have to write something down later because right now the whole franchise just pissed me off. Yeah? I was basically saying how the whole talk, like I mentioned on the show earlier, about how I think the team has been set back five years with this Thibodeau hire. Yeah, I I think it has. And you know what? I'm sure a lot of people are going to disagree. And maybe I'm going to be dead wrong by next year. Maybe Maybe this team is one of the shockers of the world next year, but I doubt it. I doubt it. I'm not seeing it, folks. It's gotten worse, not better, in terms of the animosity. Okay, so let's continue. The forecaster says, man, I don't know why. There's people who think playoff experience pays off to players like Towns and Wiggins. They don't get motivated by losing this way. Players like the rookie on the Jazz, that being, of course, Donovan Mitchell. Players like the rookie on the Jazz will be great. They don't need to lose to succeed. Towns and Wiggins are talented to a point, but they have low basketball IQ, and that's it for them. Uh, Wiggins has a low basketball IQ right now, um, without a doubt. It, it's like you want to believe there's more going on, but it's it's a low basketball IQ. If he's going to constantly take the same bullcrap, like fadeaways from, you know, low percentage fadeaway shots, 
that's low basketball IQ and a coach that's not getting to him at all. Simple stuff. Simple stuff. It's not getting to Andrew Wiggins from Tom Thibodeau. Uh, it's, you know, I, I don't get it. Um, I was saying how, yeah, I mean, I kind of want him to get traded now too. And I, I, I hate saying it because I like Andrew Wiggins. I do. Um, he's saying, you're right. We're done for another five years. Have you watched the rookie on the Jazz? Wiggins shouldn't need four years to show who he is. And that is absolutely a fact. Four freaking years. Four freaking years. That That's a long time. And, you're, and he's worse, I, I think. Not better. Did he get stunned with the additions? It seemed like all the way back to when Carl Anthony Towns got here, you saw less from Wiggins. And every time other players got better, Wiggins, it's like he would get frustrated with it because, you know, he's not far and away the number one guy. Whereas when he was the number one guy with the Wolves, he had a higher basketball IQ. He was attacking the basket. He was coming down with authority. He was making spectacular plays. It was his team, and it was exciting. And then, well, luck has it. We get the number one pick in the draft. Why can't these two stars be stars? Why does it have to be, oh, screw it, fine. If Carl's a star, I'll just be this guy floating around the perimeter and taking shots whenever I, whenever I feel like it. I'll take a lot of shots, but they won't be good ones. I'll just take a lot of shots, that's all. And that's kind of what's been going on with Mr. Andrew Wiggins. And yes, I have watched Donovan Mitchell. He's got a bit of, uh, mm-hmm. he's got a little bit of uh, Dominique in him. And he is, uh, you have to think that he was a 13th pick in the draft and the Wolves picked seventh last year. Yeah, says something, doesn't it? Uh, Marcus is saying Towns also, it shouldn't take four years to see who he is. It's been three so far. Uh, Forecaster says he thinks Jalen Browns is better than Wiggins too. And I was saying, yeah, I mean, that w- um, Donovan Mitchell's already better than, uh, um, I, Donovan Mitchell's already better than Wiggins and it makes me sick. He is better than him right now. Wiggins could be better again, but he's not right now. Uh, he says if a playoff beatdown is opposed to ma- to make them get it together, <laughs> getting beat by the getting beat by Atlanta or other bad teams should have had the same effect. Yeah, I mean, you know, get motivated. You know, after you lose to Atlanta, maybe like, okay, we're not this bad. The hell with that, and then go on a long twi- uh, win streak that takes this team into another position. Um, I was saying it should have woken them up. I don't think they're gaining anything. No, and it, uh, you know they're gain- Carl might be gaining something where he needs to tough enough and be ready. That's the one hope I have with Carl. Andrew, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what Andrew's going to learn. I, he's going to get it sometime, somewhere, someplace, hopefully here. But how much of an improvement will he make? I don't know. I'm very confused. Um, I don't know, man. But I do think Towns did get some valuable uh, experience. I do. Um this hopefully is finally the time where this will get him going. The frustration with him and Joel Embiid earlier in the season got him going for a while, and then he got punched in the mouth on occasion again, and then he dropped off again on occasion. Uh, guys like Paul Gasol and such. Like, Paul Gasol just, uh, did I say Paul? It's Mark. Mark, and, well, you could say Paul too. Mark Gasol, especially with Memphis, though. Obviously, both of them played for Memphis, so that's where the... Same stupid thing keeps coming in with me. I can't do it right, right? <laughs> and I was saying, yep, they didn't gain much. Marcus says not a damn thing. But it, what it did do is show us that Tibbs bleeped us. And the crew he put together wasn't worth the talent we sat through years of losing to get. Uh-huh. Yep. That basically, we sat through years putting this crew together, and he just figured, oh, they're not worth it. They, it wasn't worth the talent. Yep. We had our own process, and he tossed it out to get guys who are too old to want to stay here and who can't compete with the Warriors. Uh Uh-huh. Rose played well, but now I'm sure he wants to get paid. And do people think we have Jimmy locked in on a rookie scale? Why the hell would he want to stay here? Yeah. He said, don't forget the assets we kept got put on the back burner to give his old team playing time. Uh Uh-huh. Gorgie. Torgie is now just an overpaid backup. Last season, he was a good starter. He was solid as far as scoring. He'd have an off night, but he'd bounce back now. He no, But now he no longer starts, and his value has dropped along with his production. And that's very true. Um, you've seen a huge drop off of Gorgie. I can't imagine he's feeling good about things right now. I like what Todd Gibson did bring, but again, he's in his 30s. And, and Gorgie, you know, he's, he's getting to be, he's, he's slowly heading into his upper 20s here, but still... He's still got some time left in his career, quite a bit left, and he, he's a valuable player, and it is a shame to see him kind of getting thrown down, and he's had some games where he hardly even got to play, hardly even got to be a factor. I've always liked Gorgi Zhang. Um, I think he's a better starter than a backup, without a doubt, an awesome conversation for Marcus the Forecaster, and that's the kind of stuff we used to have together when he was on the air. Sometimes we'd ramble a little too much, which probably bored people and made the show too long, but that's kind of how it goes, I guess. 
that's where we needed to clean things up a bit, I'm sure, at times. But, you know, <laughs> things are what they are today. I'm generally the only host of the show now, and that's okay. But I'd like to have him on once in a while, or at least just get the the texts. That does help the show quite a bit, the texts or audio submission, this and that. It's good to have conversation still that can be brought to the show. Uh, it's one thing if we have a conversation. I can't remember all of it. See, when he texts stuff to me, then it's right there in front of me. So it's simple and ready to go. Good conversation uh, right there. Uh, we're both frustrated, as you could tell. And Vinrock, Vince Germano, is frustrated with the uh, direction of the franchise right now. I'm concerned. I think I think I'm right when I say this. This Tom Thibodeau hire instead of somebody else might have been a huge mistake, huge, colossal mistake for this franchise. And we've been there and done that before. And it's not trying to be an ass. It's just it's just the way it is. Now, you know, David Kahn sent the team back for for a long time. Uh, yeah, we get the idea. Kurt Rambis was crap, but then again, he didn't run the team. He just coached it for two years into oblivion. Thibodeau's a better coach than Kurt Bleep and Rambis, but obviously, it's a style of basketball. You might as well be using Windows 95, 98, or 98 on your laptop computer. Might as well be. Might as well be using it and um, see, see how it works at this stage. You get the idea there. Major shout out to Flips Army. Flips Army Facebook page. I forgot to do it earlier and I apologize. I want to thank you again for allowing me to post uh, links to Timberwolves Explosion on your Facebook page. Great in game thread and other conversation regarding everything Timberwolves on the Flips Army Facebook page. Nice people on there. Thank you again, Trevor Wickerwin, for allowing me to do that. Uh, so the least I can do is give a shout out and encourage people to join, which many have from this show. So, yep, yeah, it is a. It is a nice, fail or fair and balanced deal between the two of us, and thank you again very much. And those of you that have joined this show from there, um, thank you very much for listening, and God bless you. And anybody out there that wants to help, tell the, tell your friends about this show if you could. Please give a positive rating on iTunes if you could. It would be greatly appreciated. Then, of course, there's the phone lines, 209-736-7877, 209-736-7877. It is a voicemail. Do treat it as such. Mention you're calling in for Timberwolves Explosion into your statement, shout-out, comment, question, and opine. On there, it's a three-minute limit because it is a voicemail. Same thing when you hit the call now button on the Facebook page, which goes right through Facebook Messenger. You join right away that way. It's nice and easy. Jump on board. You're on. And then three-minute limit, same thing. Thanks again. As long as you're on any type of uh, Wi-Fi or data plan, you're good to go. And then the final route was what Vince Germano did, and I love it. I love it, and I hope more people do it. I hope Vince does it again. Please, Vince, do it again. Oh, do it again. That was awesome. That was awesome. Wayne Hunt, Stu Benson, any of you out there, Kalen Woods, hell, you know, if you want to throw in any type of Laker conversation, I don't care. It's okay, as long as it's mostly Wolves related. But you can make little things about the Lakers too, like we're gonna we're gonna get uh, Wiggins or whatever. I'm just kidding, but you know how the Lakers are; they're kind of like the Yankees of the NBA. They, oh, we need a first baseman, Jason Giambi. We need a pitcher, Roger Clemens. We need uh, another pitcher, Javier Vasquez. You know, it's like really, you know, <laughs> but that's how it goes sometimes. That's the kind of free agents the Yankees sign and the free agents the Lakers sign too. Some sometimes it didn't always work out that way though. Sometimes, once in a while. <laughs> yeah, the Minnesota tried to do it once with uh, Ryan Suter and and uh, Zach Parisi. We're still waiting to get to the Western Conference Finals once, and those guys are getting old and their contracts aren't going away. So yeah, the one time we did it, surprise, surprise, surprise. Yep, shocking, right? Shocking. So. The audio submission route, the point of how to do that. Use your smart device, any free recording application. Obviously, they're free everywhere. There's, they're usually built-in applications on there. Treat it like a phone call. Keep it to three to five minutes, whatever. Vince Germano's is a little over three. Perfect call. Perfect. Um, save it and email it to paladinolive at yahoo.com. Live at yahoo.com, which, again, all this information will be in the show description if you want to copy and paste or direct link, whatever the heck it is. Uh, and then I will convert the file into MP3, which I did today with zomzar.com or converto.com. I want to thank those websites for providing that always because it helps the show so much. So thanks again for providing that free service. And of course, larger files would give you, you know, you pay a little small fee to uh, do like a whole show or something, convert it over, which maybe one day I'll need to do that. We'll see, but not today at least. So thanks again for joining. Tell your friends about the show. Give a positive ratings on positive rating on iTunes or Stitcher, if you could, would be greatly appreciated. Talk to you soon. Uh, be a few weeks, I'm sure. Maybe there'll be a playoff uh, catch-up at some point. Other than that, State of the Timberwolves is coming up. Remember to get your uh, to get ready, your Timberwolves season MVP. Biggest disappointment and biggest surprise. They'll post a thread on the Facebook page very soon about that. Please, please do 
include yourself in that conversation. It would only help the show make it bigger and better for the State of the Timberwolves 2018 coming up, which it usually does in June. So I'll be living in a different uh, city at that point. I'm leaving Brooklyn Park for probably Golden Valley, like 99% chance it's Golden Valley. But uh, if there's any last second change as well, it is what it is. New Hope, Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, something like that. Brooklyn Park's just too far away from everything. So heck with that. Other than my regular job, I guess, which is kind of funny. But my wife works at the airport. It's nowhere near Brooklyn Park. So you get the idea. Yeah. So again, and also the lawn services in Golden Valley, that helps a lot. So yeah, there's personal information you don't need to know. But eh, what the hell? Might as well share it at the last second. Take care. We'll be back soon. Sorry this is a little long, but I guess there was a lot to say. So talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.